All right. So we'll revise the previous lecture. We started the discussion with the ImageNet data set. And we looked at this very interesting article which says that this was perhaps the data set which transformed AI research and possibly the world. Part of the reason was that they, this data set led to this data set challenge called ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge. And most of the teams were not using deep learning or deep learning was not performing very well up to the early 2010s. But in 2012, there was a team which used deep learning methods. They were able to get the error rate less than 25%. And going forward, almost all of the teams were better than the previous years. So this turned out to be the pivotal moment. We also discussed the fact that the architecture or the underlying neural network was not very different. In this case, it was AlexNet, was not very different from what had been used by Anlikon in the late 90s. What changed? What three things changed which made the deep learning revolution a success? Better? Better algorithms, better? Better hardware, GPU accelerators, and? Better data sets, larger data sets. We also discussed about the suitability of multi-layer perceptrons for image recognition-like challenges or for image re recognition-like problems. We said that modern day cameras, they produce very high resolution images. And if we were to take a very, very simple classifier, multi-layer perceptron, and with let's say only 100 hidden uh, neurons, neurons in the hidden layer, it may turn out to require several GBs of data even for a simple binary classification task. The other problems with MLPs were that they don't really capture the spatial structure which is present in images. The spatial structure means that nearby pixels are similar. Secondly, you're also looking to detect certain features which you can shift across the image. So for example, in this image, the feature that you're looking for is maybe the ear of the cat, which shows particular kind of features. Irrespective of where the feature occurs, you will still say that it's a cat. So we need to build feature detectors which are translation invariant. Second was the spatial detection uh, locality. So the key idea was to be able to build certain feature detectors which can look at an image, figure out the main things which can distinguish between objects. If you were to distinguish between cats and dogs, we discussed one particular feature. What is that? The ears, the ears of dogs are probably a little more rounded, a little more droopy, whereas for cats they are a little more pointed, more triangular shaped. The eyes are also slightly different. The color of the eye is also slightly different. The overall structure, the way that there is a tail, etc., that is also slightly different. The whiskers are different. So all of these are useful features which will be able to distinguish between the different classes of objects. At this point, we went on and said that let's first try and understand the problem from a 1D dataset perspective. We said that if we have a music genre classification problem, it's a 1D time series signal. We want to classify it across the different genres. We can take the time series, and in this case, we're zooming in. And we have made a very simplifying assumption that it consists of only pluses, plus ones, zeros, and minus ones. There are only three levels. <coughs> We want, to build, <clears throat> we want to build feature detectors which can tell you the low amplitude regions, the falling edges, the high amplitude regions, and the rising edges. We said that we can use a convolution operation and a very simple filter. In this case, we're using a filter of length three. The convolution operation means that we multiply minus one with one, minus one with one, minus one with another, and we add these things. Our output becomes minus three. We slide the filter one position to the right, and we get the output to be minus 2, 0, 2, 3, 2, so on and so forth. So we then said that we can use the ReLU of the convolved output of or the convolution operation applied on the filter to the data set, to the time series. And if we do a ReLU over it, with this particular filter, we'll be able to detect the low amplitude regions. Similarly, we said that we can detect high amplitude rising edges, falling edges. Once we have that, <coughs> we have some <coughs> very basic features. Can you go and open? Can someone just go and open the door? <coughs> so 
so we have the <coughs> sorry we have these different filters and then we said that once you have these basic filters you can create more complex filters based on these filters so at this point we also looked at the filters and the convolution operations the building blocks of cnns in the case of 2d so we have this input which is a 2d image it's one channel only grayscale image we have the filter 0 1 2 2 2 0 0 1 2 we multiply pixels individually element wise and we add up to get a single value in this case it's 12 then we move the filter one place to the right and we get another value 12 we move it one place to the right then we move it one pixel below to the leftmost place and therefore we get this output of this 3 cross 3 image our input image was 5 cross 5 the filter is 3 cross 3 the output is also 3 cross 3 we looked at the basic calculations given n cross n image filter size f cross f what is the size of the output n minus f plus 1 cross n minus f plus 1 we looked at this so we also discussed that if you start with the 32 cross 32 image you keep applying 5 cross 5 filters it will very soon reduce to very small size so therefore one problem which we have seen thus far is that networks can get very small input sizes very quickly if we just keep applying the convolution operation so we are thus not able to go very deep into the network which is a problem because deep networks have traditionally been shown to work well for certain kinds of problems so therefore we looked at uh, the solution which we looked at was to look at padding but before that we also looked at there is yet another problem which padding can help we saw that the leftmost pixel or the corner pixels they occur in lesser number of calculations compared to the middle pixels which is making things a little unfair for the corner pixel so their features might not be very well captured so therefore to solve both these problems we said that we can put a block of zeros both sides of the image once we do that the image size is artificially increased we have only put in zeros and we do get the output size which is going to be now slightly bigger okay question padding of p pixels n cross n image f cross f filter what is the output size remember the padding happens on all the four corners what is the size if it occurs on both the corners if you're just going from left to right do you get 2p extra pixels you need to account for so instead of n cross n image now you have n plus 2p cross n plus 2p cross image in one sense that's all you need everything else remains the same so n plus 2p minus f plus 1 cross n plus 2p minus f plus 1 we looked at something on same padding which means that the output size after the convolution operation and the padding remains the same as the previous we looked at another building block which is known as strides so we also want to do an operation known as subsampling i showed this in the original linet architecture they have this thing known as subsampling so what we're saying is that if we have very large images all of the pixels don't add a lot of value if we look at two neighboring pixels they are very likely to be correlated so therefore we can subsample and reduce the number of computations that we need to carry out so the idea is that can we skip every s pixels so in this case you can see that i am skipping so i get this this filter applied 3 cross 3 filter applied here i get one output and then i have skipped two pixels i my filter is applied to these last three columns and i get another value so therefore i have skipped two pixels so s will be two here and then we looked at the size we also discussed max pooling and average pooling so pooling layers the idea here is that instead of multiplying with the filters we just pick up the maximum value or the average value in the set of pixels that the filter is applied over okay we stopped at this point so if you were busy with your own things you can now come back as i've already told please don't use earphones if you want to use please market attendance and you can leave the class
So if we have a n cross n cross c image, in this case, what is c? C is 3 here. It's a RGB image. Now, how do we apply filters on RGB images? Thus far, we've been applying filters on grayscale images, or which is just one dimensional images. What do you think needs to change? Sorry? Yeah. So, if our input is having C channels, and the way the convolution filter works is that we have to apply element wise multiplication to element wise multiplication, and then we do the addition. So therefore, corresponding to the C channels in the image, we will also need to do C channels in the filter. So we'll have a filter for the red channel, which is size F cross F, a filter. So once we apply this filter on the red part of the image or the red channel of the image, N cross N cross one. So it's now again, if you just consider the red channel, it's a grayscale. You can think of it as a grayscale image and you have a filter for it. For n cross n image, f cross f filter, the output is n minus f plus 1. So you get a red channel output correspondingly. You similarly, you have a green channel filter. You get n minus f plus 1 cross n minus f plus 1. You have a blue channel filter, and there also you get n minus f plus 1 cross n minus f plus 1. So therefore, once you apply all these three filters individually, you'll get three grayscale images. And once you get three grayscale images, you add them up. You add them up to get a single grayscale image. So in some sense, you are now reducing, you are trying to do the averaging or the summing up across the three different channels output. So your output now after summing up is n minus f plus 1 cross n minus f plus 1 cross 1. In this specific example, we took an image which was 3 channel, we used a filter which was also 3 channel, the output that we're getting is a single channel image. Right? So you'll always see that the input image, the number of channels in the input image has, you'll have to correspondingly have the filter size having the same number of channels. If this is not happening, you'll have to you'll have some bug in the code. So this is a simple sanity check. The output that you get is a single grayscale image for each filter that you apply. Once you do that, you still have to get some element of non-linearity. Thus far, we have not looked at any non-linearity. We looked at very simple non-linearity in the 1D case. Right? So we looked at this non-linearity. We said that we can apply a ReLU on the output that we're getting. Right? And once we did that, we were able to do a specific kind of a filter, which is trying to detect the low amplitude regions. So neural networks, we do need the non-linearity. This was also one of the question that we discussed in the tutorial as well as in yesterday's quiz. If you don't use such non-linearities, you can have arbitrary deep networks and you'll still end up with something equivalent to linear regression. So therefore, this non-linearity, we need to now introduce, once we have applied the filter, the, the C channel filter, and we've done the convolution operation, obtained a grayscale image. After that, we apply the activation function. But before we apply the activation function, we always add a bias. So we have this activation function, which is applied on this grayscale image, plus B. Right. What is the dimension of B? Is it 3 cross 3? Is it 1 cross 1? How many think it's 3 cross 3? How many think it's 1 cross 1? It's a scalar. Okay, so it is indeed a scalar. We apply this Simple. So think of the bias, if you remember the perceptron model, it was always just a threshold which you were adding or subtracting. So in this case, you're adding a simple single threshold. Okay, so once we have looked at how these different layers work, 
let's do an exercise. It would be good if you can team up. So just two, three people together can discuss and then we can have the answer. Okay, so he wants to ask why are we not using a K cross? Okay, ask, ask. Can you speak a little louder? The output is three images which have been then added to get a single grayscale image. And then you add a bias and then you apply an activation. So the final output that you'll get will be a grayscale image, which means a single channel image. Right, so let me repeat. You start with an image which is C channels, N cross N. You apply a filter which is F cross F cross C channels. For individual channel, you get N minus F plus one cross N minus F plus one image. You add the three images. You get N minus F cross one cross N minus F N minus F plus one sized image. You add a bias to it. You apply a nonlinear activation to it. You apply the nonlinear activation element wise. So each element you apply a ReLU on it. If it's negative, it becomes zero. If it is positive, it remains the same. So finally, the output that you get is n minus f plus one cross n minus f plus one cross one. If you also want to consider the channel, is this clear? Any further question? Okay, good. So if you want to get an RGB output, a single filter gives you a grayscale image. How can you get multiple outputs? A single filter gives you a single image. You want multiple images in the output. So what needs to change? Number of? Number of filters. Right? So think of this as you have a certain filter which is trying to detect horizontal edges. One. Certain filter trying to detect vertical edges, horizontal edges, slanted edges, etc. You have multiple such images, multiple such filters. Once you apply such filters, you will get corresponding to each, you will get a single dimensional image or sorry, 2D image, grayscale image. And then you can concatenate all of them to get a multi-dimensional image, a multi-channel image. Right? So this will become clear when we look at this specific example. Do team up with your colleagues so that you can discuss this. So this is the LANET 5 architecture, which was proposed in Jan Likun's paper. You have an input, which is 32 cross 32. You have some C1, which is some feature maps, which is 6 at the rate 28 cross 28. What do you think 6 at the rate 28 cross 28 means? Does it mean 6 channel? Does it mean 6 filters? What is 28 cross 28? So you have applied convolutions to an input image. You get a new image, which is six channel image of size 28 cross 28. Right? So I'll go over this, but first I'll start asking the questions. What is the size of the input being fed into the model? 32 cross 32 cross one or one cross 32 cross 32, depending on where you put the channel. Right? That's the first thing you need to be sure of. It's a grayscale image. Okay, what is the filter size for the first layer? Assume that we have not done any padding. So if you remember, uh, the output size is n minus f plus 1 cross n minus f plus 1. If you have to go from 32 to 28, so n is 32 and n minus f plus 1 is 28, f has to be 5. So 5 cross 5 filter, if you apply, you get 28 cross 28 image. Right? But if you apply a single filter, you get a single grayscale image. But now you're getting six channels in the image, which means what is the number of filters used in the first layer? Corresponding to each filter, you get a grayscale image. If you have six channels in the output, it means you have used six filters. So therefore, the number of filters used in the first layer is six. Okay. After this, let's say we are using a pool filter. So you want to go from 28 cross 28 to 14 cross 14. What is the size of the pool filter? 
with a simple pool fitter suffice you also need to do some uh, some striding how do you go from 28 cross 28 to 14 cross 14 let's look back at the pool filter and striding so striding gives you n plus 2p minus f uh, divided by s the flow plus 1 and the pooling picks up works basically like convolution but instead of doing anything else it just picks up the maximum or the average value where the filter is being applied okay so it comes out to be a 2 cross 2 filter with stride of 2 will get you from 28 cross 28 to 14 cross 14 I'll let you work this out on your own to figure out that this will be indeed correct. How did we get to know? So typically you know the stride and then you get the output. Okay, so we get from 28 cross 28 cross 6 to 14 cross 14 cross 6. So again, I'm saying if you want to listen to some music or do something else, please mark attendance and leave the class. So we move from 28 cross 28 cross 6 to 14 cross 14 cross 6. <coughs> After that, uh, this is where it gets a little interesting. We, the next image size is 10 cross 10 and 16 channels. So what is the size of the filter for this convolution? Anyone? Anyone wants to volunteer and give the answer? 5 by 5. Is this the correct answer or is it an incomplete answer? So what did I tell a few minutes earlier? Now you have an input image which is now a multi-dimensional image. Or it's a multi-channel image. 14 cross 14 and 6 channels. If we look back a couple of slides. If our input image is C channels the filter has to have how many channels? C channels. So therefore, if our input is 10, sorry, 14 cross 14 cross 6, how many channels should each filter have? How many channels should each filter have? 6 channels. And if you want to go from 14 cross 14 to 10 cross 10, what is F5? So therefore, each filter that you use is of size 5 cross 5 and 6 channels. It's so sorry, I forgot about writing 6 channels there. How many filters are we total using? 16, because our output is 16 channels, 10 cross 10 image. Right? If we use a single filter, what would be the size of the filter again? Using a single filter, the size of the filter was? 5 cross 5 cross 6. If we use a single filter, the output size would have been 10 cross 10 cross 1. So if you have, if you apply a single filter, you get a single grayscale image. Because we have 16 channels in the output, which means we have used 16 channels, sorry, 16 different filters.
<coughs> okay so there is some doubt let's go back to this particular slide let's imagine that this particular filter that you're using is useful for detecting vertical edges so vertical edges would mean some combinations of plus ones zeros and minus ones right so let's assume that this particular filter is vertical edge filter now if you have a horizontal edge filter you'll have some similar values but the transpose of it corresponding to each such filter you'll get an output which would now be different because one of them is detecting vertical edges the other is detecting horizontal edges you get a grayscale image now once you get a grayscale image or you get a channel of a multi dimensional multi channel image you just stack them up so this becomes the output corresponding to channel 1 or this the first output is corresponding to the vertical edges the second output is corresponding the second channel is corresponding to the horizontal edges slanted edges etc this is becoming clear so this is where i think most people will make mistakes so once you apply this so let me clarify the questions from the audience if you have n cross n cross c image you have applied a single filter the single filter has to have the same number of channels once you have applied that you get a grayscale image one filter being applied you get one channel of the output you apply another filter you get another channel so on and so forth so each filter you can think of acting independently on the input. right so vertical edge filter has got nothing to do with the horizontal edge filter etc is this becoming clear any further questions so 6 to 16 so let's say that n was let's let's uh, put the numbers here so n was 14 right from the linear example n is 14 and c is 6 right and the output that we get for corresponding to a single channel is 10 cross 10 cross 1 right if you applied only a single filter the f size there would be 5 and this would be 5 cross 5 cross 6 right so n is n is 14 c is 6 f is 5 and this would also not be 3 this would also be c equal to 6 correspondingly you get a single grayscale image whose size would be 10 cross 1 sorry 10 cross 10 cross 1 one filter being applied you get 10 cross 10 cross 1 now you apply a different filter you remove this filter you apply another filter of the same size 5 cross 5 cross 6 you get another output which is 10 cross 10 cross 1 you apply another filter you get 10 cross 10 cross 1 you apply 16 such filters you get 10 cross 10 cross 16 Or 16 cross 10 cross 10. So the each filter is applied to the entire image. That is why the number of uh, the dimension has to match. Each filter has to be same dimensional as the input. Any further questions on this? Um, okay so kishan's question is that do we learn separate types of detectors for separate images uh, for separate channels so let's look at the way things are going you eventually add them up and then you're trying to get some average representation average uh, averaged out activations out of them right so each one like Traditionally, when we start from conventional learning, we tend to think of what could be some filters which could be useful. Right? But when you do it end to end, we don't really need to be very specific about what any particular filter will learn. Right? So we just give this entire set of filters to the Autograd engine. It will be able to learn some reasonable values. 
which are able to then extract out certain useful features, which are then being passed on to higher order feature build, uh, like building features. Eventually, you'll get the classification accuracy. We'll look at this specific question in a slightly more detail in a few minutes when we look at what different filters are learning. I'll show one specific example of that. But before that, are the sizes clear to everyone? We went from, we were here, 16 filters, each of size 5 cross 5, f is 5 cross 5, and the number of channels in each filter is 6. So therefore, we have now gone on to, uh, got to 16 channels, 10 cross 10. We again do subsampling, we get 16 5 cross 5, which is the same as the previous level of subsampling. After that, we notice that we have 16 cross 5 cross 5 and then we have something like a full connection which is now from this point onwards, it's just a multi-layer perceptron. Okay. So this is a multi-layer perceptron, this is a layer of multi-layer perceptron containing 120 neurons and this contains 16 cross 5 cross 5 values. So the typical practice is that we will flatten out this 16 cross 5 cross 5 to a 25 cross 16, 400 length vector. Right? You had 400 values, which were somehow represented in a 25, sorry, 5 cross 5 image with 16 channels, but you just flatten it out to get 400 numbers, a vector of length 400, which can be thought of as the inputs to the next layer in the multi-layer perceptron, which has 120 neurons. The next layer in the multi-layer perceptron has 84 neurons, and finally we have 10 uh, neurons in the final layer. Why do we have 10 neurons in the final layer? What kind of a problem are we trying to solve here? It was a digit classification kind of a problem. So therefore, we'll have 10 layers in the, sorry, 10 neurons in the output. We don't need to think about what is a Gaussian connection, et cetera. You just think of cross entropy loss would be applied. Finally. Is everyone clear on the architecture? Okay. How do you come up with these numbers? So Andrea Ng says very nice, like he gives some rules of the thumb. One, can you notice that you start off with images which generally have very low number of channels, right? So let's think of channels as the depth component. Can you see the channel as the depth component? As the channels are increasing, the depth of the image is increasing. Right? So he mentions this very nicely that typically in practice, you start with images which are big in size but have very low depth. But as you move from left to right, you typically see that the depth will increase and the image size will reduce. And then to some extent, it looks almost like a flat vector. It is, is almost looking like a flat vector and which is what at that stage you end up being connecting it to MLP. So that's one convention. The second convention which has usually worked very well in practice is some combination of cons and pool. Con, pool, con, pool, con, con, pool. Some architectures like this have worked well in the literature. So Andrew Ng also very nicely mentions that the first thing you should always try when you're trying to create newer architectures is to use previous architectures. So I just repeat his words there. The, the terms 120, 84, 10, you could either do some hyperparameter search and get these things, or you could just use some, like it's, it's both an art as well as a science of figuring out what works, what doesn't work. Typically, you'll see that it reduces. The dimensionality will reduce. You don't want to be going straight away from 400 to 10. Typically, you want to you reduce it slightly slowly. Right? So there are various kinds of architectures being done. Some architectures, which are specifically focused on reconstruction-like tasks, like autoencoders, they will have something known as a bottleneck. So they will have start with 32 cross 32, come down to, let's say, 10, 20 dimensional representation, and then go back up to the 32 cross 32 size. So they'll apply the inverse of these operations. Instead of convolution operation, they'll apply something known as con 2D transposed or upsampling or resampling. So there are a few such operations being done. Does that answer your question? So we can see that we have input, then we have con 1, con 2, then fully connected layers, etc. So my next question to you is to figure out the total number of parameters in this model. Each filter is a parameter in the model. I mean, it contains multiple parameters because each filter is a matrix or a tensor. So it's the simple things first. Does pooling add any parameters to the model or no? 
So parameter would mean some specific value which you multiply and add. Does pooling have any of those characteristics? No. So therefore pooling does not add any parameters to your model. Does convolution operation add parameters to the model? Yes, because there are certain weights you need to apply. Uh, you need to add and then there are certain biases. Do MLP, uh, does the MLP part add parameters to the model? Yes, we have already seen that, right? So why don't we first go to con, con one layer and tell me the number of parameters just for con one. So first you need to tell me the filter size, 5 cross 5, the number of filters, 6. For each filter what is the number of parameters you need? It's a 5 cross 5 filter, so the number of parameters you need is 20, no, 25 plus something, plus the bias. That's where we mo mostly make mistakes, 25 values in the filter plus the one bias. So six filters of size 5 cross 5 cross 1 plus corresponding to each filter you have a bias. Right? Each filter was adding a single bias. Let's go back. Corresponding to this filter, we had a single bias B, single scalar which was the bias. So therefore, con 1, six filters, each filter size 5 cross 5 cross 1 channel plus corresponding to each filter there is a bias so 156 parameters pool 1 no parameters now for con 2 can you tell me the number of parameters this should not be simple given the previous exercise you have how many filters in the second con layer 16 filters each filter is of size 5 cross 5 or something else 5 cross 5 cross 6 what is that number 25 into 6 is 150 and how many biases? The number of biases is equal to the number of filters. So therefore 16 filters of size 5 cross 5 cross 6 plus 16 biases. So 16 into 5 into 5 into 6 plus 16 biases 2416. After that you have flattened out this. Flattening doesn't cause any parameter change. So this is now 400 numbers here and 120 numbers here. Right, so n1 into n0 plus the number of biases etc you needed to add. So therefore in the first fully connected layer you have 120 into 400 plus because this layer has 120 neurons so for each neuron you have a bias. So the number of parameters is 48, 120. Fully connected layer 2 you go from 120 to 84 so therefore 84 into 120 plus 84 biases and then you go from 84 to 10, so 10 into 84 plus the 10 biases. Therefore, the total number of parameters is 61,706. Now, it's a huge number of parameters. What kinds of layers are contributing more to the parameters? Fully connected layers or the con layers? Fully connected layers. What kind of layers do you think take more time? Like when we do the forward pass, which layers will take typically take more time to compute the forward? The convolution layers, because you're applying them element-wise, you're striding, you're moving forward, etc. Right? So a lot of repeated operations are being done, though the number of parameters is less. Right? Why is the number of parameters very less in con layers? Because of a concept known as weight sharing or parameter sharing or concept sharing, something like that, right? Because what we're saying is that what we're building is feature detectors. The feature detector at one part of the image is the same as the feature detector for the other part of the image. So you're sharing the parameters across the space, which ends up creating smallish filters. Large number of smallish filters, 
which ensures that the number of parameters in the con layers is very small, but the time taken would still be large because you'd have to do the forward pass, you'd have to do the convolution, moving the filter across different input images across multiple filters. The fully connected layers have very simple calculations. It's just summation wi, xi plus b, but the number of parameters becomes very large. So you were asking, some, some of you were asking the question on how to decide the number of um, parameters, the number of neurons and layers, etc. This is another way to decide. You think about the total number of parameters, the amount of compute time that you have. So therefore, a lot of architectures that you will see will initially have a lot of con pool, con pool kind of layers, which reduce the image size very quickly. Once you have reduced the image size, then you can apply these multi-layer perceptrons. If you applied the multi-layer perceptrons directly, then we had the issue of a huge number of parameters, which we discussed in this slide. Right? So therefore, even with a very large image, if the image was 108, cross 1 million cross 3, if you applied con pool, con pool, con pool, con pool, con pool 10, 20, 30 number of times, the image size would have reduced significantly. Let's say each pooling you're reducing the image size by 2. So if you apply a few 10, 20 number of times such operations, the image size would be reduced significantly. After which you can apply the fully connected layers. Any question in this? I'll show the notebook in a second. Okay, I can perhaps show the notebook now. So this is the notebook corresponding to the LANET architecture. I'll just skip all the other details. I'll just show the LANET model. I have a CON1, the first CON, which contains six output channels, five cross five convolutions and the input channels is one. So this is the format in which PyTorch is using. The CON2, six input channels, 16 output channels, filter size is f, uh, f equal to five. Then you have a linear, which goes from 16 cross four cross four to 120. This is slightly different from the original LANET, uh, from the LANET architecture I was showing in the notebook. Because here the sizes are 28 cross 28 cross one, instead of the 32 cross 32, which I was showing in the slides. The original LANET was actually on 28 cross 28, I believe. I don't know, maybe uh, I'm saying one of the thing, things wrong, either in the slide on, or in the notebook about the exact linear architecture, but the essence remains the same. Then you have two linear layers. When you do the forward, you get the con one, which reduces the size. Then you do a max pool with a specific stride. Then you do a con two, you apply max pool. Then you do a flattening. Then you do a FC one, apply ReLU, FC two, ReLU, and then so on and so forth. If you're very carefully looking at this notebook, you may realize that there are certain small things which I'm missing, such as activations at different places. So that I leave up to you as an exercise to figure out if I'm missing activations at certain key points in this or not. So then the training is as usual. I will skip those details. Now, one of the reasons why CNNs have become very popularly used, very successful, is the concept of transfer learning. To some extent, you saw this question in yesterday's quiz. Not exactly, to some extent. We'll say that we had a network which was trained on ImageNet. Now, ImageNet is a huge data set. Let's say we have picked up the 1,000 class problem. Right? The network was something like this. Input image, let's say 224 cross 224 cross 3. Then you have con pool, con pool, con pool, et cetera. You have some MLP layers, and then you have a 1,000 class classification problem. Now, let's say you want to uh, learn a separate classifier, which is cats versus dogs, and for some reason, let's assume image that does not have cats versus dogs. Or you want to do some binary classification or a task, which, which the concepts of the classes don't exist in the ImageNet data set. How would you modify this architecture? This was the same as what I asked yesterday. You have to think about modifying the architecture, you have to think about modifying the, what is the training process and how the weights are initialized. So firstly, if it's a binary classification, how many nodes should I have in the output layer? Two. So I can't use this output layer. So what I'll say is that <coughs> I'll kick out this output layer and I'll have some R versus S, let's say, 
rabbits versus squirrels I am doing classification and they, these concepts are not present in the original data. I will call the initial part of my network as a feature extractor or with feature creator part of the network. So what I am hoping is that once I have trained the model in a very large publicly available data set, the features will still generalize. Like even if I am trying to, so features might be picking up horizontal edges, vertical edges, contours of face, etc. Because I have trained on a very large data set across large number of categories, I am hoping that the filters would still generalize. Right? So these would be certain important filters that are being learned. And I will say that let's, there are variations in this. I will say that for the first variation, I will say that let's fix the feature extractor part. Right? I don't modify the weights. So this is meant by what, how do you initialize the weights. So if we modified the architecture, kicked out the thousand layer, uh, output neurons instead just put two that's the change to the architecture change to the weight is that I'll assume this to be fixed I will then say that let me just fine-tune the weight or let me just tune the weights of the MLP component this way I don't have to learn this component again from a smallest data typically why we need such things is because our data sets which we want to use in practice would typically be orders of magnitude smaller than data sets like ImageNet so therefore, you will not be able to learn very difficult concepts or uh, generalizable concepts across uh, on only on your data set. So that's why we use this concept of transfer learning. We'll say that let's just modify the weights of the MLP. How do you modify the weights of the MLP? Feature extractor, if you give any input, it gives you a transformed input, let's say x dash. You start with x dash, you feed it to the MLP whose weights you can learn and then you can apply the same cross entropy loss to modify the weights of this MLP. There are multiple ways in which you can practically implement this. One, you start off with, you pass on the input images as X, you get X dash, and then you just train the network from X dash to this binary classification. The second is you keep the entire network, but you say that these components, these things are not trainable. There are methods in PyTorch like libraries. You can set certain attributes to be not trainable, certain weights, layers to be not trainable. You don't propagate the gradients. So on and so forth. So that's a key idea. That is known as fine tuning, the weights of the MLP. Sometimes when people say fine tuning, they can also modify the weights of the con layer slightly. Because certain times for, let's say if there are very different concepts in your data set, maybe you want to fine tune, adjust the weights of your con layers also. That's another thing people do in practice. And finally, when some of you are asking about visualizing, different filters. So you can look at this nice interactive article called CNN Explorer. You can start off with any input image. You can look at the different channels. You can look at what is happening within what specific things you're learning. It sort of take you some non-trivial amount of time to understand what is going on in these images. I'll skip the specifics, leave it up to you. I'll also skip uh, this very interesting slide deck, but I'll show why CNNs work well in practice. We've been discussing about a couple of features and a couple of layers, the max pool kind of layers and the con layers. So this article shows that there are two important terms which we want in CNNs, which is equivariance and invariance. So we want our models to be shift invariant, which means that if our problem is a binary classification problem, it's a cat. If I move the cat slightly, if I shift the cat to another part of the image, it should still be predicted as a cat. So this concept is known as shift invariance. There is another, there's a mathematical way to look at this. For shift equivariance, we look at a different task, which is known as segmentation. So segmentation, given an image, it will return a binary mask, 0, 1. 1 where there is a cat pixel, 0 where there is no cat pixel. So now if we shift the image, what we want is that the, the, the segmentation that we do should also shift by the corresponding margin or the cor corresponding translation. So that concept is known as equivariance. In invariance, we are seeing that the, the classification should remain the same. In equivariance, we are saying that the, the detector should shift the same way. And this article now nicely talks about how shift invariance is 
achieved by max cooling approximately and how equivariance is achieved by uh, the convolution operation right this is only if you are very interested in the subject i will not discuss the details this is advanced stuff i don't expect you to be able to i won't ask question on this specific thing but if you are interested in knowing more you should definitely read this article i'll link this up in the class website okay so we'll end today's lecture are there any questions?